All right, good morning, everyone. Glad to see you here today. It's a beautiful day and a beautiful day to be in the house of the Lord, where your past does not determine your future. What a place to be, amen? Let's go to the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, that you are always faithful. You are always with us. Lord, you will never forsake us. And Lord, we just give you all the glory and praise today as we lift up your name in our praise and just glorify you with everything we sing, we say. Lord, be our voice, be our feet, our hands. Lord, as we present you in our daily lives, Father. And Lord, just bless the praise today, bless the, the preaching today. Lord, we just give it all to you. And we are so thankful, Lord, to be here in your presence among our brothers and sisters. And we give you a shout and we sing hallelujah to you as we praise and lift our hands to you and glorify your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we praise you. Amen. Let's give him glory. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness be restored. Oh, these are days of great trials, a band of the darkness and sword. Still we are the voice in the desert crying, preparing the way of the Lord. Riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, and the trumpet calls. Lift your voice, hear a jubilee, out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. These are the days of Ezekiel, the drivers we go up in the flesh. Of your servant David, who built in a temple of grace. These are the days of the harvest, the fields are wide in the world, and we are your laborers in your midst, declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, we come, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, as the trumpet calls. Lift your and out of sight until salvation comes Behold he comes Driving on the clouds Shining like the sun As the trumpet calls Lift your voice Year of Jubilee And out of sight until salvation comes There's no God like Jehovah 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 Father, we praise you and we glorify you. Yes, Lord, we praise you. Hallelujah. I'll praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. There's praise in the water, my enemies drowning. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise the Lord of my 
closer to you today. Lord, we seek your face today. Lord, we just be, want to be in your presence and let your power overtake us, Lord Jesus, as we exalt your name and we give you praise and we glorify your name. Oh, Holy Spirit, come today. Holy Spirit, come. Fill my heart, Lord Jesus. And I praise you, Lord. be close, close to your side, so heaven is real, and death is a lie, I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one, hallelujah, holy, holy. God Almighty, when I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, when I am.
surrender father lord we seek your face this morning we want to know you more jesus i want to be in your presence i want to feel your presence around me i want to know your power and your strength in my life lord jesus i want to hear your voice i want to be one with you father fill me lord jesus fill me Jesus, oh Jesus, here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all, Jesus. Lord, as you draw me desperate for you, I'm desperate for you, I surrender. Unfold, I hunger and thirst. 
Lord, I open up to you and I allow you to do the cleansing, the purifying, Lord Jesus. Let the power of your precious blood, Lord Jesus, cleanse me, redeem me. Lord, we worship you, Jesus. Oh, Rabashi. The Lord says, remove those blockages, those walls that stand between you and me. And what are they? The offenses that you keep. The offenses towards your family, towards your church, 
member, family, offenses will stand between us and stop the flow of the Spirit in this place. Offenses will stop you from hearing and receiving the things that I want to tell you and the things that I want to give you. Take those offenses and throw them to the side as if they were a piece of dirty trash that you don't need in this temple, in this house. I will help you, says the Lord. These are hard things that I ask, but I will help you because I want you to come to the place where you are the best in me that you can be, says the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your words. Lord, I pray you speak to each and every one of us today. Lord, it's so easy to allow offenses to take control of our life. So many things happen every day in our life. They may not seem fair, but we as a church are better than that because we serve the one true God yes, amen. who will take us through these trials and tribulations. Yes. And you know, if the devil can win by allowing you to get your feelings hurt, right. allowing you to take these words that other people say or these actions that they do against you, and allow you to put up those walls, Satan is won. He is winning in your life. And the Lord is saying today through that word, Tear down those walls. Allow him to tear down those strongholds. Those offenses are not worth eternity because you know eventually those offenses are going to take control of your life. Take victory. Take victory. And, they, and you are going to stray and you are going to become angry and rebellious. Thank you. Oh my. Oh my. There's no room in that for our lives. That's right. That's right. And we're all human. <laughs> These things hit us every day, but we need to recognize it. That's right. We need to recognize it at that moment Hallelujah. and speak glory and speak peace and speak forgiveness yes. over those who have hurt you, those who don't agree with you. Oh, there's a good one. Those who don't agree with you. <laughs> oh, yes. We are filled our world is filled with that today. Everywhere we look, people don't agree with us, whether we're right or wrong. <laughs> but our eyes need to be focused on the Lord, and you need to recognize those inst instances and say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, tear down those walls that I'm building. Lord, and help me to forgive. Because, Lord, if I don't forgive, you can't forgive me. And it's time. It's time to say, Satan, you are a liar. Get beneath my feet. I'm going to trample on you today. I'm going to take back. I'm taking it back. I'm taking it back. And from here forward, I'm going to recognize these attacks that you put against me and I am not going to allow you to have a stronghold over my life anymore because I am a child of God. Amen. Amen. I am a child of God. And Lord, I serve you. I surrender all to you today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's do this. I can find a right and teach a situation. 
gonna hear the sound I'm calling the angels down I'm storming the gates of hell Tell the devil he don't own my soul I'm taking back what the enemy stole I'm raising the battle cry I'm holding the banner high With the power of the Holy Ghost I'm taking back what the enemy stole Oh, oh, oh You can't speak the lies over my family no. You can't break the promise that I stand no. Ain't got a place to put you back in your place Now one day is all I gotta say Jesus, I'm calling the angels down I'm storming the gates of hell Tell the devil we don't know my soul I'm taking back what the enemy stole I'm raising the battle cry I'm holding the battle high With the power of the Holy Ghost I'm taking back what the enemy stole Oh, oh, oh Take it back with the enemy store. Oh, oh, oh. You can't see the lies of my family. You can't break the promise that is stand. Ain't gonna put you, put you back in the place snap. One day is all I gotta say. Jesus, I'm calling the angels down. I'm storming the gates of hell. Tell the devil he don't know my story. Take it back what the enemy stole I'm raising the battle cry I'm holding the battle high With the power of the Holy Ghost I'm taking back what the enemy stole Oh, 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 oh. Take it all back, take it all back I'm taking back what the enemy stole Oh, 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 oh Take it all back, take it all back And take it back with the enemy stole Hallelujah We're going to take it all back In the name of Jesus, amen Thank you, worship team Hallelujah God is good Amen It's good to be in the house of the Lord today With air conditioning Glory to his name, hallelujah I want to thank everyone who helped us down at the car show yesterday We had a Wonderful hot time. It was very, very hot. I, I, those of us who are fair complected, we came back with nice sunburns even underneath the canopy tent that was there. But we were able to share the gospel. We were able to share Jesus and uh, give away some stuff and all that. And it was just a, a good time. Now, it, this year wasn't quite as big as last year because we had found out we were competing with Wichita Car Show and our car show together, which was unfortunate. But God still had us there for a purpose and a reason. And we know that no matter what we may think has gone on, God has done something spiritual through that. I had people come by and said, oh, I like little books. So we gave them a Gospel of John. We gave them a story about Christmas. We had some of those left over. And you know what? Who knows what God will do and how he will use those things because we had sown the seed. And because we were sowing the seed, we may not see a harvest immediately, but we're going to see a harvest. Amen. Greater than what we have sown in. Everyone agree with that said? Amen. And if you didn't get a, ha a chance to help with the Act Out Fund, we still haven't quite raised all the money to pay for the supplies. So if you can help with that, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, yeah, I don't say a lot on offerings and stuff here, but don't put your tithe money in for that. Uh, you know, because there's a tie-in offering, which God requires, and there's the love offerings, gifts that God says, out of your heart, you give out of love, and those kind of offerings, those special offerings. So if you can help with that, that would be awesome, too. Everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we're going to continue with the message, but before I get there, I just want to mention one thing. I know uh, a week or so ago, has it been, whatever, two weeks ago, I mentioned how um, what was going on at the Olympics was so awful and bad, which it was. But remember what the scripture says, that God has a way of working things together for the good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And I can say for the first time that I can remember in a long, long time, I saw unity in the body of Christ. Not just the assemblies of God, not just, but unity worldwide on an issue. And you know what that did? That gave me hope. Because what Satan did there was principalities and powers working, in, you know, working there to try to bring destruction. 
he got a black eye. I think he got two of them. Maybe a broken nose along with it. But the body of Christ came together worldwide and condemned that. And I think glory to God. It's about time we come together on something. Amen. Now we could come together on the cause of Christ. Amen. And, and I just, it was just awesome to see the, a big prayer meeting taking place around the place and people coming together. And you know what? They're all different denominations. And they might not pray the same way we pray, but they were there to pray and to show their support for Jesus Christ. And I say praise God for that. As a matter of fact, all the excuses they made about what was not, yes, it was, but what happened to it? They took it all down. Amen? So that shows you the power of unity when we get involved in, in fighting principalities and powers. God came, God, God got the church together, and victory took place. Amen? Hallelujah. Glory to his name. So we're going to continue on our series that we've been on, and um, we're going to do part two of my message last week. <laughs> and I was told how hard my message was. As a matter of fact, a good friend sent me pictures of his toes, <laughs> all bloodied and bandaged. <laughs> but you know what? God's got answers. Amen. Amen. And I think this is going to continue to be a difficult, but I think it's stuff that we need to hear, but I also think it's going to give us hope more than we've had before. So we're going to continue. Take it all back. Crucifying the flesh, part two. Crucifying the flesh, part two. Ephesians 6 and 12, for we, wrestle, uh, for we wrestle against, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and power, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And as I think the Lord is speaking to us clearly the time we're living in and demonstrating to us that God wants us as his people to be involved in spiritual warfare and push back the gates of hell, push back these principalities' powers down, and show by actions, you ready for this? Show by actions that God is still ruling and reigning, God is still on the throne, and God is still doing great and mighty things. And this, this thing that we are being involved in, it takes not only spiritual things, but it also takes the physical things. We have to put some feet to our actions. Everyone agree with that said, amen? Because faith without works is what? Dead. If we say we believe something, then we need to act upon what we believe. Because that's what faith is about. I believe God's word. Now I'm going to act in faith that God's going to perform that word. Everyone agree with that said, amen, right? And the physical part is also just as important as the spiritual part. And we've got to get that deep down in our heart. There used to be a false teaching that went around in the first century church that uh, has developed over through time and keeps reappearing over and over and again. It was this, that we, as far as God was concerned, as long as you kept everything spiritually correct with God, you could do anything you wanted with your physical body. You could live any way you wanted in your physical body as long as you kept the spiritual part right before God. And that was called Gnosticism. It had developed. It had grown. And it's working its way back into the church over and over and over again. Satan just redresses it in a new box. He regifts it, if you know what I'm talking about, all those kind of things. And what we need to recognize is this. That is not true whatsoever because whatever we do in our spirit will affect our physical bodies. And what we do with our physical bodies will affect our spiritual life also. So you can't separate them. Because if I separate my spirit from my body, what do I have? I'm gone. I'm out of here, okay? Hopefully I'm with Jesus, right? But so what we have to understand is here, our physical lives are just as vitally as important as our spiritual lives. And we need to act in a correct way. Everyone agree with that said? Amen. Living a crucified life is part of being successful in spiritual warfare. Following God's word and leading with the power of the Holy Spirit can give us victory over our mind and our flesh and the devil. Everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to go back here and look at some truths here. Next, this next truth we're going to look at is actually point three on the message from last week. We must crucify our flesh one time. Wouldn't that be nice? The only one who had to crucify his flesh one time was Jesus. Amen. Amen? But guess what, saints? We, as human beings, have to learn to crucify our flesh on a daily basis. Aren't you just loving that right now? I wish it was one time and it was over. 
I wish some of my brothers and sisters that preach that once you got filled with the Holy Ghost, you got a special sanctification where you never sinned again. I don't know where they're living at, but they're not living in this world, okay? Because every day I need to make sure that I crucify my flesh. Galatians 5 and 24 says this, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lust. Affections here simply means this. It means evil passions. And how many say today, Well, Pastor, I don't have any evil passions. How many lost your temper before you got to church this morning? <laughs> Oops. We all have to deal with evil passions. Everyone agree with that? And then it says, you crucify the flesh with its, evil, uh, with its affections and lust. And this word lust here, it means this. In the context of this sentence here in Galatians uh, 5 and 24, lust here means evil desires, longings, and cravings. And so the idea here is that what Paul is telling us that all of us, if we allow ourselves just to be, quote, who we are, that we're going to find ourselves being tied down with strong evil desires here. That's going to, the flesh is going to rise up and it's going to begin to conquer us. But I want to say something about the word lust here. The word lust is a neutral word. The word lust doesn't, it just simply means this, a strong desire. That's what lust means. And here's where I want you to see something here. And we don't use it in this context because in our economy here, our culture, lust is usually meant in a negative connotation. It's usually something bad and something evil. But the word lust isn't. It's just a neutral word. So what makes lust evil is what we're lusting for. If I'm lusting for things of the flesh, then that's evil. That's wrong. If I'm lusting for God, strong desire for God, I want to tell you, that's good. If I'm lusting for the Word of God, that's good. If I'm lusting for the Spirit of God to move, that's good. So what makes the word lust good or bad is what we're lusting for. And I got to stop and ask ourselves a question, and I ask myself a question, what do I lust for daily? Amen? Now, we can lust for things that are good taking beyond the normal bounds. Okay? And that becomes wrong. We can lust for things that are absolutely wrong, and we know they're wrong, and of course that's wrong. And so we have to learn here, saints of God, is how to handle lust when it comes into our lives. When it's negative, it's, God, you know, it's there to, to bring on the lust of the flesh. It's there that's negative. We have to learn how to crucify that thing on a daily basis. And we're going to look at that here in a little bit more in just a minute. But if it's good things, I'd say let's lust more for God. Amen? Let's lust more for the Word of God. Let's lust, lust more for the preaching of the Word of God. Let's lust more about assembling together in the house of God together, worshiping the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen? Let's lust for those kind of things and give Satan a big black eye. Amen? Now, as we looked at last week, we went through all the lust of the flesh. And they're all lust of what? Our flesh. They're not demons. They're our flesh. But that does not mean Satan does not use the lust of the flesh against us. Amen? And so what Satan does, he has a role that he plays that causes a big problem for our flesh. And here's where a lot of the, the, the power comes when we understand this. I know many understand it, but I want to preach it again. Satan is the tempter. Everyone agree there? Satan is a tempter and he is a deceiver. And what Satan does, he tries, to dis he tries to steal from us by presenting the bait to us that our own flesh and fallen nature likes. How many fishermen do I have here? You're trying to catch certain fish, what do you use? Certain bait. And what the enemy does here, he's constantly throwing bait at us, trying to find out what our flesh likes. And when he finds out what our flesh likes, what we want to bite on, what does he do? He throws it to us again and again and again and again and again, hoping we will take the bait. Everyone agree with that, said? But let me tell you something here, saints of God. We don't have to take the bait. Amen? We don't have to. Because Satan's bait is designed to steal, kill, and destroy. 
And what happens is that when we begin to yield to the works of the flesh, we find it's a growing problem. The first thing is not in the outline, but first, lust starts out like this. Lust starts out, and then the first thing we do is we yield to it. What I mean here is that we willingly partake of whatever the bait is being thrown at us. And at this step, at this first step here, we are still in control. We can still stop it at will, and we can still say no because we're still sensitive to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. We can repent of it, turn away, and stop that attack. How many think that's a good thing to do? But so many times is that we don't stop at the first stage because, man, I got away with it for now. Everything's going good right now. And, and so, boom, you know, we, just kind of, we just kind of put it on the back burner there. The second step is this. The work of the flesh left unrepented, unrepented grows into a habit. Say habit. And what happens is, is that this work of the flesh that, that, this, that we've been baited with, that we are we desiring to act upon, now it's no longer just something we can control at our will and do it if not. Want it. Now we have a habit that's been created, and the habit demands that we pay attention to it. The habit demands that we, that we give in to it. And what happens is that now our control over it becomes more limited. And we stop denying our flesh. We stop, we stop crucifying ourselves daily. We don't repent. And the next thing you know, man, this process is getting harder and harder and harder, which leads to the third stage here is this. The third stage of the work of the flesh left unchecked, the habit goes into a stronghold. And at this point in time, this growing problem with, the, with the, 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 the lust of the flesh, now we've created a stronghold in our lives. And at this point in time, we live for the high of the stronghold. Everything that the enemy throws at us, we desire, we want it, because now our life is not controlled by the Holy Spirit. Our life is now controlled by the stronghold that we allow to be set up in our hearts and life. And our mind is hooked, our flesh is hooked, and we are completely bound and trapped by this stronghold. And it's is that when we get bound by this stronghold, the word, the flesh has taken control, and then we are dragged away. And the next thing you know, we find ourselves in a whole, whole mess of things. And I have good news for you today. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross for us to be bound by any stronghold whatsoever. Amen? And that even includes the work of our flesh. We're not to be bound by any of that whatsoever. And so we see this progress that's happened. And I want to say right now, saints of God, none of us are perfect. We all mess up. And if you see this one thing, I messed up this one time, repent of it immediately. Deny your flesh. Pick up your cross and follow him so it doesn't progress to the next level and the next level and the next level until we find ourselves completely bound by it. Everyone agreed with that said? Amen. Because God doesn't want us to lose control over those things, and we need to take back what the enemy has stolen. Amen? Now you say, I, want you, I, I don't know if this is up there or not, but if it's not, willpower alone cannot break a stronghold or crucify your flesh. Because you say, if I just have the willpower. How many have been on a diet? How much did that willpower help? It helps for a few minutes, maybe a year, hopefully, maybe a short period of time. How many have made New Year's resolutions? You got the willpower. I am going to make the changes this year. And then February 1st comes along, and what happened to the willpower? Well, let me tell you, you can have the willpower that you want to crucify the flesh. It's not going to happen. You can have all the willpower you want to deny your flesh. It's not going to happen because willpower alone can't do it. But let me tell you this. You do need to have willpower, though, because you have to be the one to say, I want to make a change, Lord. I'm the one, Lord, that wants to be set free. I'm the one who wants to be delivered from. I'm the one who wants to put to death this, this flesh of mine. I am the one who's willing to do this, Lord. And here's what happens. When you get to the place of being sick and tired of being sick and tired. Anyone ever been there? When you get to the place to say, I've had enough of this. I'm tired of being bound by this. I'm tired of being defeated by the enemy. And God, now I am ready to make a change. It's like salvation. When I'm ready to make a change, I come to him. He saves me. When we get to the place where I'm ready to make the change, the power of the Holy Ghost empowers your willpower. 
the power of the Holy Ghost comes upon us that we can do great and mighty things in the name of Jesus. The power of the Holy Ghost comes upon us that we can put to death our flesh. The power of the Holy Ghost comes upon us where we can break the bondage and the strongholds that are in our life and take back what the enemy has stolen. And I'm saying, saints of God, it's time to give God your willpower so he can empower your willpower. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Hallelujah. And you know what? My God's power has got enough power to take care of all of it. But we've got to turn it over to him. But we've got to be ready. You know, I, I think about, I don't know how many have ever watched any of the shows um, about people who have got addictions and how they've given away everything. They, they, I mean, just everything. They sell everything. They'll do things that are wrong just to get the high. That is a major stronghold bondage. But it doesn't, they don't get set free until, you ready for this? They decide they want free and get the help that they need. Well, their help may be a little bit different than the help I'm talking about. I'm talking about the help of God. He wants to help every one of us. Everyone agreed, said? James 1 and 14 says this. But every man is, what's that next word? Tempted. And that word man also means womankind too, okay? We're not going to be... You know, when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Now, the first thing I need to say here about this is, is no person is above being tempted. Jesus Christ himself was tempted and always like us, except he was out sin. Amen. Being tempted is not a sin. Being tempted is a test to see who you're going to serve. Am I going to serve my flesh or am I going to serve God? Everyone who doesn't like that, say amen too. Amen. But thinking you are above temptation is a work of the flesh called pride. Amen. And pride goes before a fall, major fall. Everyone agree with that? Now, this word tempted simply means this. It means tempted to sin or wrong. We all are that way. And anyone that tells you that you have arrived, you'll never do it again, they are not telling you the truth. You need to run. The next word I want to look at there is enticed. And this word enticed means this. It means to, it means to lure and to bait. And, and, and Satan is constantly trying to lure and bait us to follow the path. But this next word is dangerous here, drawn. You know, every man is tempted when he's drawn away by his own lust and enticed. This word draw means to drag out, pull away, and drag into captivity. And how does he do that? He throws the bait, hoping that we will grab that bait. And it's not the devil making us do it. Agreed? Flip Wilson, theology is wrong. The devil cannot make me do it. The only way the devil can cause me any harm is when I choose to yield to his bait and take the bait. Because greater is he that is in me than what? Amen. He does in the word. That means he's greater than my flesh. Amen? Amen? And, and so when we're drawn away here, we're drawn away by our own cravings, our own lust, and it's a sinful nature resurrecting itself on a daily basis. Basis. Galatians 5 and 24 again. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its, with its affections and lusts. And this word crucified means this. Okay? The word crucified is this. It means to stake to a cross, to put to death on a cross. And that means a literal cross or a figurative cross here, cross. And so, again, Galatians 5, 6 and 14, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Now, that word crucified there is also a verb. It's an action word. And crucified to the world means this, okay? I don't have to go the way of the world any longer. That ought to make everyone a shout. I am crucified to this world's ways. I'm, cru I'm crucified to the things of, of Satan here. They no longer have control over me because I've been crucified to them. And what the Apostle Paul is simply saying here, I have been crucified to what the enemy's doing. I've been crucified to what the world's trying to do to me because I'm standing in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ today. And I want to tell you, saints of God, when we understand that truth, we'll have an easier time denying our flesh because I am dead to these things. When my flesh rises up, I need to say this in the name of Jesus. I am dead to the lust of my flesh in Jesus' name.
I am going to appropriate Christ's resurrection in my life and his death in my life at that moment. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Anyway, we know also this truth. Jesus doesn't want us to literally drive nails in our hands and feet. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. He doesn't want us hanging on a wooden cross in a public somewhere in the heat of the day and everyone mocking us and making fun of us. That's not what he's talking about here. But what Jesus wants us to do, again, is this. Look unto his literal physical cross where he literally and his physical body died for each and every one of us. He died to his human nature at that point in time. He died, and then not only did he die, he resurrected once again. I want to tell you, saints of God, there is power power in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's power in his cross, and he wants us to look to the victories of his cross over sin and death in our lives also. God is good, isn't he? Yeah. Important part of crucifying our flesh is simply living in the power of the cross. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw, my, saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away, it was there by faith, I received my sight, and now I'm what? Happy all the day. When Jesus declared, it is finished, what Jesus literally did there, he paid for our sins in full, right? But he also sacrificed his physical body to pay for that sin so you and I don't have to go to a cross and sacrifice our physical bodies. His sacrifice was once and for all. And the reason Jesus could do that, Jesus never committed one sin whatsoever. And now, saints of God, we can, we can claim and appropriate Jesus. It is finished. We can claim what he did in his body for our physical bodies and also for healing. Amen? Yeah. To put to death the sinful nature through his grace and mercy. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment, how much God loved us. When God wrapped himself in human flesh, what do we call that? Jesus' birth, right? God wrapped himself in human flesh. And that meant, you ready for this? Jesus was 100% man because he came from Mary. Amen? Amen. At the same time, he is 100% deity because he's God manifested in the flesh. And so Jesus then was born with a human body just like the ones that you and I have right now. He was born with a human body that had the old nature in it. He was born with a human body that was tempted in all areas just like us. And here's something I see is very, very important. How many have ever had temptations come your way? You think, God, I'm the only one who's ever had this temptation. How do I succeed? How do I get through this? And you know what you need to do? Jesus was born with the same nature, except he didn't sin. Amen? He had no sin. But every temptation that you've ever faced, every trial you ever go through, Jesus has already faced that in his humanness. And saints of God, Jesus overcame his humanness not by the power of his deity. He overcame the weakness of his flesh through you what? The power of the Holy Spirit to be an example to you and I how we can overcome in our humanness also. And you think about that. God going to that extreme to become one of us with that fallen nature, without sin, to put to death that flesh's work in order for us to have victory. The only way Jesus could be tempted in every area as we were tempted was to be tempted with the same things that we have been tempted with. The good news is he overcame. The good news is he didn't sin. And he put to death, if you would, that physical nature that he got from Mary through the power of the Holy Ghost. And what that says to each and every one of us, you ready for this? None of us are with excuse. How many got the Spirit of God in your life? How many have the Holy Ghost? That means we too can put to death that because Jesus put his body to death for us. I'm claiming that sacrifice today. Amen? And again, this crucif crucif and the crucifying the flesh is not a one-time event. It must happen daily. And if we die daily, what we're saying is this, okay? I abandon the power of the lust I abandoned it and let it go. Everyone think that's a good idea? 
I abandon it, let it go. If I'm dying daily, I'm saying this, I am now choosing to live in the power and the blessings of God as a free child of God not bound by the enemy, and I've taken back what the enemy has stolen. When I die daily, I'm saying to my flesh, not my will, but thy will be done. When I die daily to my flesh, it means I'm, I'm serious about my relationship with Jesus Christ. When I die daily, it means I have a desire to walk in his holiness and his righteousness. When I die daily, it means I have a desire for spiritual victory and in this warfare to take back what the enemy has stolen. Amen? So, saints of God, spiritual warfare, a critical, a critical part of it, is crucifying our flesh on a daily basis. Uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 says this, Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, I want to, this is in there, but you can put this in your notes. You ready for it? The works of the flesh are ignited by a thought left to grow. The works of the flesh are ignited by a thought left to grow. Let me say this right now. You cannot help thoughts going across your mind. I like this old Pentecostal illustration. I've used it many years, but it has been for a while. If a bird flies over my head, what can I do about it? But if the bird flies over my head and brings some straw and some weeds and some soft material and begins to make a nest in my head. Whose fault is it? It's mine. Yes, the thoughts will happen. Yes, it will come. They're going to come. But at that point in time, you have to make a decision what you're going to do with it. You're going to allow that bird to build a nest or are you going to rebuke that thing in the name of Jesus and tell it to be gone? Amen? And, and so the idea here is, is that these thoughts come, but we have to take these thoughts into captivity. That word captive there, captivity means to capture, to take prisoner, to cast down the thoughts. And, and I'll give you a good example of this. Um, whether you believe it or not, I'm a normal American male. How many normal American males do I have here? And only males raise your hand. <laughs> As a normal American male, we have a problem, especially in our teen year, age years, with lust. And ladies, I know you do too, so that's apply just the opposite way. Everyone agree with that? Yes. Us American males have a way of going, there is skin over there. Yes. And us American males left with our flesh think, man, isn't she beautiful? But wow, there's another beauty over there, and I want every one of them. I'm going to Kansas City, and I'm going to get me some pretty little women. Okay? That's the works of the flesh. Amen? And unfortunately, young men, our society teaches you that is a good thing to have in our culture. The cat calls and the whistles and all those kind of things. You know, makes you a big man. Amen? No, no amen on that one. So, one of the things Job did, he said this, I have made a covenant with my eyes not to lust after a maiden. Have you read that scripture? Go look it up. And so, I had to discover a principle in the Word of God that I cannot be lusting after people. Amen? Amen? Can't be. So how do I protect my eyes and make a covenant with my eyes that I don't lust? Well, there's a principle I found in one of the books that was on, on manhood was this, called the bouncing principle. Amen? Because normally we've been taught, every time I see it, I look. But the bouncing principle is this, and it becomes habit. You don't even know you're looking sometimes. You just look. There it is. And the bouncing principle is this, and you have to train yourself to do this. You have to train yourself to bounce your eyes immediately when you see something you should not be looking at. And so we can go around this, and, whoop, and you bounce your eyes. Okay, and what I'm saying here is simply like this. I had to retrain my mind. I had to retrain my thoughts. I had to take my thoughts captive to bounce my eyes every time I looked at something that was attractive with a wrong motive. Amen? 
And then what happens if you do that over and over and over and over again? It becomes a good habit in your life. And the next thing you don't, you don't realize is, but all of a sudden, bouncing your eyes becomes a normal thing, a normal practice. You just do it naturally because you've retrained your flesh there. You've denied your flesh, and the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you retrain it, and you just simply, it's gone. You just don't, it's not, you're not uh, drooling anymore. And how I know that happened one time, I love antiquing, right? Went to an antique mall, walked into the, the, the restroom, and, you know, I just went, went and didn't, like, my business came back out, and someone asked me what I thought of the pictures in there. I go, what pictures? Because the whole front of the entrance was nudes. And I got so accustomed to bouncing my eyes, I didn't even notice that. And I say, victory ahead. I put to death what belonged to my sinful nature. And that happened through the power of the Holy Ghost and his help. Amen? Casting down, imagine, casting down here, it means to overthrow, take down, tear down, and destroy. You know, that's what we got to do. We got to tear these things down when they come out. And the word obedience means submissive, submissive, obedience to authority beyond oneself, submission to the ways of righteousness. And I have to make a choice here is this. If we're going to crucify my flesh, who's my God? Is Jesus my God? Then I have to submit to his authority. God forbid if Satan be my God. That means I'm submitting to his authority. And here's a fact. The flesh cannot be your God, even though we have it. We must take control of the thoughts and bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And if we're not living the crucified life, if we're not taking our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ, we're going to find out that sin will flourish in our lives. We're going to find out that the strongholds are going to take a hold. And saints of God, here's the bad part. We open the door for an attack from the enemy. Satan's going to attack whether there's an open door or not. Everyone agree with that? But let's don't open the door for one. Amen? We begin to give in to the authority of the flesh, and next thing you know, man, everything is all messed up because we're not submitting our minds to the control of the Holy Spirit. The devil's attack against our life would not work if our mind and flesh did not cooperate. Amen? Amen? We have to cooperate with him. I'm tired of cooperating. Anyone else tired of cooperating? Tired of it. The next statement, I want to look at this, and this is where we need to see a difference. You can command the devil to leave your flesh. You can command your flesh to be delivered from the bondages it finds itself in. And look at the next phrase, and nothing will happen. Everyone's saying, uh-oh, get the tomatoes out. Here's why. You ready for it? You can't deliver flesh. Flesh has to be what? Amen. You can't cast out flesh. Flesh has to be crucified to the power of the Holy Spirit. So when you look over the works of the flesh that we talked about last week, those things have to be put to death in your life, and that's between you and the Holy Spirit doing it. I can't go out and cast a drug habit out of someone. I would like to. I can't do that. But I can pray through they get, the, they get to the place where they are willing to surrender to the Lord, and through the power of the Holy Spirit, they put to death what belongs to their sinful nature. And, but on the other side of this, uh, this is this, of uh, the coin. You can't crucify a demon. Right? Demons have to be bound and cast out. And that's the difference between dealing with demonic things and dealing with the works of the flesh. The flesh has to be crucified, and demons have to be, have to be cast out. Everyone agree with that? Amen. Amen. Now, I want to say something about demonic possession here just for a moment. If you're a born-again, spirit-filled Christian, the only way you can ever get demon-possessed is if you totally walk away from God 100% and reject God 100%. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? I also want to say this. Demons do not want to inhabit speakers. Demons do not want to ha inhabit guitars. Demons do not want to ha inhabit that chair. What do demons want to inhabit? Human beings. 
As a matter of fact, Jesus was casting out a, 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 some demons, and he was going to cast them out into outer darkness and just go out there and get away. And the demons pleaded with them, you know, uh, pleaded with Jesus. And I don't exactly understand why he did this, other than for an example. And they said, well, uh, if we can't go back out there, if we can't go back into uh, our human, at least send us into the pigs. Right? And the demons went into the pigs, and what did the pigs do? They were saying, we're not having this either. We're going to crucify our flesh also. And they ran over the edge. Boom. The demons go to and fro trying to find some place to inhabit. I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. So I'm saying that to say this. I can't come up here and say, oh, let's get rid of the speaker. It's demon possessed. If I actually believed that was demon possessed, if I actually believed that, why then am I saying I have to get rid of it? And why aren't I just casting it out? You know what? I've heard people say, hey, alcohol is a demon. Well, I understand what you're meaning. I think it's a demon in a sense too. But when's the last time we manufactured demons? You know, all of sometimes the things that we attribute to demons, and it's nothing to do with demons whatsoever, okay? It's the works of the flesh. Why do I produce? Well, I don't produce it, but why do many people produce alcohol? Because their flesh has a desire for alcohol. Yep. has nothing to do with demons. Now, that's, again, doesn't mean that demon's not going to put it in front of him and try and begin to take the bait. Yes, he can, but you can rebuke that demon and tell him to get on in the name of Jesus. But saints of God... Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. Colossians uh, 3 and 5 says this, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Now Paul goes on to another work of the flesh here, and, and I'm not going to go through those right now, but mortify means this, put to death. Treat at, to treat as dead the sinful desires of the flesh. We're to treat it as, as dead. It's, it's, it's gone. And the members here, treat your, mortify your members here. It says this. Members means limbs or parts of the body. And, and again, because of what Jesus Christ has done here, we are to treat the members of our, 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 our we are to uh, mortify our deeds of our body. Now, you know what, saints of God? Our bodies are important. We are to glorify God in our what? Everything we do in our body should bring glory to God. And we should not use our members then, our bodies, to do things that don't bring glory to God. Everyone agree, said? And Paul gives a reason for this, and I'm going to finish up here real quick. Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says this, If ye then be risen with Christ, first thing he says, Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Verse 2, set your affections on things above, not on things of this earth. Verse 3, for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ, where Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. You know what that's the promise of that last part? The rapture of the church, saints of God. Amen. How many want to appear with him in glory? Amen. Hallelujah. So through salvation, Colossians 3, 1 through 5 again here, if, if you then be risen with Christ, and the idea here is this, through salvation, Jesus Christ, be, we become partakers in his resurrection. And now we can now, because of his salvation, we're risen with him, his resurrection, we can be living and enjoying the benefits of the resurrected life. Saints of God, we are partakers of his resurrection today. That means we have, we have life in our bodies, however. Hallelujah. We can live in the blessings and joy of God because our life in is set upon his resurrection. Christ is not only the author of this new life, he is the sustainer of this resurrected life. He's able to keep us to the very end. Amen? The second thing is this. Seek those things which are above. And you know what? And so Christ is not only the author of the new life, he's the source of the new life. As we fix our eyes upon heaven, we fix our eyes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We fix our eyes upon the Father. Jesus is sitting in the right hand. Hallelujah. We then get the blessings and power from heaven also. The third thing is this, the right hand of God. And set the right hand of God means this, supreme authority. This deals with everything about God that can be ours as a child of God living in this resurrected life. Isn't that good, saints of God? And the fourth thing is this, set your affections on things above and not on this earth. And this deals with our crucified life. Again, I have 
haven't arrived at all this, but I'm striving to be that way every day. How many of us trying to strive to be that way every day? Amen. Hallelujah. Romans 8 and 5 says this, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Now, Colossians 3 and 4, this is the fifth thing, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So that means we're physically dead? For you are dead. What we were before salvation, we had no choice but to obey the flesh. The flesh ruled us 100%. But because Christ's death, he put to death the flesh, now through the resurrected power of God, amen, because of that power, we are dead to our old man. Our old man no longer has control over our lives unless we yield to it. Now, because the old man's put to death, hallelujah, I can deny myself, I can say no to the flesh, and I can walk in faith and victory. Amen? That word head there means, also means kept safe, concealed, and hidden. And the idea is now that we now have a new identity in Christ. I am no longer what I used to be. I'm a new creation in Jesus Christ, and the old has passed away, and behold, all things have become what? Jesus put to death in his flesh the absolute power of flesh over each and every one of us. And now we can claim that death of Jesus Christ and live in his victory. And now my life is hid in Jesus Christ. The old has passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And then the reward for this. Verse 4. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear... Then shall you also appear with him in glory. And that is dealing with a promise of the rapture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That word appear there simply means this, a manifestation to receive his people unto himself. And as I was looking up what that meant in some of the original language there, it's a, talking about a special thing happening. Jesus' first coming was special. Everyone agree with that? You know what the next special thing on God's timetable is? the rapture of his church, when he appears, hallelujah, and takes his people home. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I think we're getting closer and closer to the day when Jesus Christ is going to come and take us out of this place. Amen? But until that time comes, we need to be busy about our Father's business. We need to occupy till he comes. We need to work like he's coming 100 years from now. <laughs> and we need to live like he's coming today. Amen? And one of these days, saints of God, he is going to manifest himself, and that trumpet of God is going to sound, and the dead in Christ are going to rise first, hallelujah, and those graves are going to be opened, and us who are alive and remain shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye, caught up together with the Lord forevermore, and forevermore be with our Lord and Savior. No work of the flesh is worth missing out on the rapture of the church. Amen? Amen? It's not. And one of the reasons I think old-time Pentecostals always preach the rapture of the church, rapture of the church, rapture of the church, because when you realize the rapture could happen any time, it gives you incentive to deny your flesh. Now, with that said, don't walk around in fear about it. Just stay close to God, keep your hand in his hand, recognize the devil's attack, deny yourself the pleasure of taking the bait, and then I'm going to get next week, and we're going to watch the devil flee with his tail tucked between his legs. Amen? Amen. God is so good, isn't he? Amen. Hallelujah. And before we close here, and I'm going to get, be sure to pick up your prayer list out there. We're praying with all the Assemblies of God churches all over the world, and we're praying for uh, churches here in the United States, and it's just a prayer guide what to pray for, so we're praying in unity. This was put out last week. If you missed it, you still have time the rest of the month to get it done. Everyone agreed, said? Amen. Amen. Go in Jesus' name. We'll see you hopefully Wednesday night in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.